All right. Which of these is Portuguese, which is a lovely rhyming title. Um, the reason I chose this title is in terms of um, my research into this particular class, which was trying to identify which dresses or which portraits were actually Portuguese and which were not. And this turned into a big part of my uh, process here. So I'll talk a wee bit about the sort of context of Portuguese women's dress, starting a wee bit talking about Portugal. Um, I haven't found that Portugal's covered a lot within an SCA context. Um, there don't seem to be many people interested in having Portuguese personas, and I think that's actually a real shame, um, because Portugal was such an important player in the early 16th century because of its trade empire and its links with Brazil and India in particular. And the important adaptation of spices and also the importing of fabrics from the east. And I did wonder how much the Portuguese would want to show off their fabrics that they've imported it within their dress. Um, one really good book, and a couple of recommendations here, is this book here, which is um, Crowley's book called Conquerors, which is about how Portugal forged, forged the first global empire. And it is excellent in talking about how particularly uh, Portugal moved into India and its, um, its time there as a conqueror. And um, it is good at showing, I guess, the power basis of Portugal at the time. When I started thinking about, I guess, the, con the idea of clothing as a um, way of showing off nationhood, I sort of started to think, well, if they're such a global power, how are they going to want to show themselves as Portuguese in their clothing? And I found this quote here from Castiglione quite interesting, where he tells off Italian courtiers for trying to dress outside their nationhood, trying to dress like Span Span Spaniards or Germans or Turkish even. So it sort of showed to me that there was this real connection between how you dressed and how you represented yourself as um, a citizen of a nation at that point in time. And I think if you are a powerful nation and wealthy nation at the start of the 16th century, you are going to want to, in some way, show off how you dress. I do not have a definitive answer to that yet. And I don't know if I ever will, but it is, it's such an interesting voyage going through and trying to find out a bit more about this area, which is not really talked about at all. For me, part of the reason I particularly wanted to explore Portugal was because I am part Portuguese. My great-great-grandfather was from Portugal and we, he was very keen when he moved to New Zealand in the 19th century to anglicise himself as much as possible and move away from his Portuguese heritage. So we don't know a lot about it at all. Um, we have a name. We know that he, he anglicised his last name to Thomas. So I've been trying to go back through the births, deaths and marriages records to find out a bit more. Again, I'm work in progress. But I just wanted to find out more about Portugal. And for me, as a, with my interest in costume history, which I've been doing this for about 20 odd years or so, making or researching and making dresses, mostly Italian, I felt it was a good way of exploring my Portuguese sort of culture. In terms of resources, um, you've got the grand, the great Anderson Hispanic costuming. It doesn't necessarily treat Portuguese dress as a separate entity from Spanish. It, it has Portuguese examples in there, but it doesn't necessarily talk about them as how they are distinct from Spanish, which I think there would have been some, because if you call someone who's Portuguese Spanish, they're going to be horribly offended. So they're not going to think, oh, how, how am I dressing like a Spaniard? They're going to think, I want to dress like a Portuguese person. And for me, part of what I wanted to do was look at the Portuguese images and see what there was. So therefore, I decided to go look at portraits. And try and work out which of these Portuguese had Portuguese provenance. And it has its own challenges as we'll, as we'll go through and we'll talk about the portrait, portraits. So what we're going to do over the course of the, this presentation is go through and look at the different portraits that I have found that I have felt to be Portuguese. And I have thrown a few red herrings in there as well because that was part of my research too. I want to discuss these. Any questions at this stage? All right, I, some of the useful things that I used, I'll see if I can get into this. Um, I went, went on to the, um, in Lisbon, there's the great Museo do, of Arts and Antiqu of, of Ancient Arts, which has got 
a lot of the Portuguese images from the 16th century that we have left. And I went onto their website and I was like, oh cool painting, one painting, great disappointment. One day I was really angry at the website and so I just started clicking on all the bits down the side and I clicked on this, this strangely named Matriznet or Matriznet and it was so exciting because what it was was a catalogue of all Portuguese art and Portuguese um, catalogues at this point in time. So what I needed to have though was some search parameters. So that is where I started to think about who were the artists that were operating at this point in time and Gregorio Lopez we'll see quite a lot of. So I put Gregorio Lopez into this and hit the search and it came up with all these images and it was so exciting. It, while that when you click on them they're actually not in the best quality I found by using that and going into uh, then trying something like a media commons I could get some better resolution images and that gave me a, a point to start with um, so the other thing I did was looking at who the Portuguese royalty was at this point in time and finding portraits of them one of the big issues about Portuguese art of this period is that in 1755 there was that massive earthquake in Lisbon and the tsunami and that took out a large amount of central Lisbon and I would imagine that would have taken out a large amount of the portraits that were in the royal palace because that was completely destroyed so it is a very much a patchwork as to what we have available um, I described this to my, my research to my husband the other night as being a bit like trying to assemble a jigsaw puzzle except you only have about half of the pieces, you don't have the handy picture on the box and so half of your pieces that you've got are mixed in with, with, with um, pieces from a different jigsaw so it's about trying to work out which jigsaw pieces go together and which ones don't fit in and certainly it's kind of you, you've got when you hit on gold and you go actually this does work it's really exciting um the Prado museum collection which i'm sure most of you are familiar with is also excellent particularly in the write-ups of um portraits as well i found those very good um this i i got a book on gregorio lopez which was turned into a little bit of my bible and um in researching clothing because it's got some really good resolution images of his paintings and I found with my cell phone taking close-ups of them I can see a lot more of the detail. Um, another great author, um, Emery Gershwin, and this is my absolute precious, this is a book called The Global City which is a catalogue of an exhibition on Lisbon in the Renaissance which is absolutely fabulous. She, um, Gershwin's written some really good articles about um, 16th century Lisbon as well and um, also Hugo Crespo is another one who has written some interesting books. More on the decorative arts of Portugal so it looks at things like um, homewares and um, what you would see within the houses and some some fabrics but a real focus on things like um, basins and trenches and all those sort of things that you'd find sort of you'd be used every day. All right we are going to now move into yep we have one question. Um, could you um, tell me the titles of the book and I will see if I can type or you can type into the chat. This one is called the yep the, um, the global city Lisbon and the Renaissance is this one. Global what? Global city Lisbon and the Renaissance. Okay uh, something Renaissance. Uh, yeah Lisbon and the Renaissance. Oh, Lisbon and the Renaissance. Lisbon. Yeah. Sorry, I can't spell Renaissance. Even no, though it's right in front of me. Okay. And that who is that by? Um, that is by Emery Gish Gishwind, which is the name just on the um, slide at the moment. Okay. Um, they're very. I found they're very difficult to, to get though, these books. Um, I, I've seen these for about seven or eight hundred dollars in US on various um, websites around. I got this one for just under 300 and I did a big dance of joy when I got found it for under 300. Okay and what was the other two? Um, the other one was Conquerors by Roger Crowley. How Portugal forged the first global empire. Okay Oh, Portugal, that should at least get you. Yeah. 
Crowley's books are good. And this one's just, I'm called Gregorio Lopez, and this is just on the artist. Okay. But no, I do think that Mitra's net search engine is probably the best place to start for looking for Portuguese images. Once you get the names of some of some um, artists, you can go from there. And is it Global City Lisbon is really what the, the title is? Global City Lisbon in the Renaissance. Okay, okay. All right. Looking at some images, the first one I picked here is of Eleanor of Portugal. Now, somewhat unusually, this is actually an Italian image which is painted in Siena in the library of the Piccolomino, which is um, the Pope there in the middle, who is the one who is taking this, this very important wedding between the Holy Roman Emperor and Eleanor of Portugal. And this is, the wedding actually took place in the mid sort of 15th century. So. By the time this was painted, it's about 50 years after the fact. The reason I've included this as my first one is I found it very interesting that if you look down here at the drawing, I don't know if you can see this, but my, on my screen it's um, kind of, there we are. You can see there there's, that this is the figure of Eleanor of Portugal. In the drawing, the way she is depicted is very much Italian. But when it's painted, as you can see here, to my eye, it actually looks very Portuguese or very Iberian, at least. Um, you get, as I see a lot of these high neck chemises or partlets. I think that was probably a partlet because it doesn't match the chemise coming out here. She's got the transada, the big sort of fake plait down the back. And the slashing in the sleeve is something we'll see again and again as we go through Portuguese art. So, what I think possibly when they were painting it is they wanted to emphasize the fact that she was from Portugal and so the it changed from this sort of Italian style dress to this Portuguese style one in the fresco when it was actually painted to show partly the, the importance of the political alliance of this particular wedding. It's a really interesting one and it's a very beautiful dress as well. The bodice itself, I put some little notes here which I'll sort of talk about and fling th swing through her as I go. Um, the shape of the bodice is quite Iberian too, as it's much higher than a lot of the Italian ones of the period. It's very cool. This is the first of our Portuguese monarchs from the time, and this is Queen Maria, and she was the wife of King Manuel. And King Manuel was the king during the great period of Portuguese exploration. And I do think if you're thinking about this linking between clothing and power, how Queen Maria is depicted is actually really important because she would, though if Manuel is wanting to show off himself as a Portuguese powerhouse, he's going to want his wife to look as Portuguese as possible. And what we see here in the dress, again we've got that very high neck chemise, um, quite a high bodice actually interestingly for this point in time, and you've got this hood with a coif coming off the back. And again, one of these really key features of Portuguese dress, the sleeves are all open down kind of the back of the arm. And what this allows is these puffs of chemise to come out and it's sort of it's tied or it will have some sort of little point of connection there between the two parts of the sleeve to create those puffs. It is very, very Portuguese. So, quite an interesting, it's quite a French, it's quite a, like a French hood actually, that one. Again, you don't see this very often in Portuguese art, so it's a, it's a little bit odd, but very interesting. Um, she's got the white belt on, um, and there are children down here, which you can see the original one, which are her daughters, which have got little sashes on, which again is very typical of what you see in Portuguese art in this period in dress. This here is Queen Maria again. And it's Queen Maria in um, the Geronimus Monastery in, in um, Belém in Lisbon. Now, again, this is, our, and it, I find the context of this particular sculpture very interesting in terms of the dress, because Belém was the place where all of the Portuguese expeditions went from. So when they were going off to the New World, they went from Belém, basically almost outside this monastery. 
And Crowley, in talking about the monastery, describes it as a fitting pantheon for Manuel's dynasty and a celebration of the new worlds discovered in his white reign. It is the sort of show place of Portuguese power at this point in time. I love the, the quote from Crowley there about Manuel having a strong Messianic streak. He believed he was the person that had come to Portugal in the 16th century to you know, make it this great powerhouse. And so I think how he wanted to depict his queen was very much in the style of Portuguese dress at this point in time. Again, you can see the open back of the sleeves. She has this hat on, and we see this hat fairly often, actually, as we go through into the 1520s as well. Um, the issue I've got with Portuguese dress is I don't have any access to written records, and I'm not actually sure what written records there are in terms of dress. I mean, looking at Italian stuff, you've got Eleanor of Toledo, and you've got all of her wardrobe records, which are fabulous, but I haven't found anything easily accessible for Portuguese at this point in time, and if anyone sees anything, please let me know. I'd love to see it. So, but the hat is kind of quite common and I do wonder how much that is very much a Portuguese kind of item of clothing and she's wearing it here to show off this Portugueseness. She goes all out on this in this headdress. She's got the hat, she's kind of got a hood over it, she's got the transata down the back. It's like how many different elements will we show the of Iberian dress in one or in one lot of hat. Really quite impressive. I love the big sort of open sleeves. Again, you see this quite a bit in English um, dress at this point in time. I don't think you can interpret any period of dresses itself in isolation. There are always things that it borrows or takes inspiration from other pl other parts of the world, even at this point in time when they're trying to show off their themselves as powerhouses. But I think for this dress, there's a real sort of focus here on wanting to show off them as Portuguese monarchs. So. The dress here is really important for establishing what it means to be Portuguese at this point in time. Question? Yes. Could you uh, define what a transanda is? A transanda is, is this fake plait that comes down the back. So you see it quite a lot in Spanish clothing of this period as well. It's like a big, sometimes it would be hair, sometimes it's sort of a stuffing that comes all the way down the back, often to sort of just below the hips. Yeah, bulbous hat. Um, I just popped these in because they are quite cute. Um, this is Gregorio Lopez, and he paints with this series of saints, and he just sort of paints the top halves of them, but you can kind of get a sense of headwear from it. So we've got this hood here, which if you think about the one under um, Queen Maria is actually similar in quite a lot of ways. It's a hood that just comes down like that and goes sort of down the back. And here, she's got what's probably quite a cute wee coif. What you see here with her hair is something which is very typical in Portuguese dress as you go through the 1520s, 1530s, even up to the 1550s, is the hair always comes over the ears. You don't see many Portuguese ears until about 1555-ish, when the hair starts to move upwards. But um, so that's very, very common. Again, a high neck chemise. All right, the Saint, uh, Saint Alta altarpiece and there are a couple of panels that go with it as well and this is probably the best um, depiction we have of Portuguese dress for the 1520s because there's so much going on here. What I do love are the ships at the back because again you're sort of showing off Portugal's power here within this image that these these are what brings Portugal their wealth and their power these ships. But at the front here, you've got the scene. And I'm sorry, some of these images are a bit gruesome, but they're really good for the clothing. So as you can see, like Queen Maria, we've got this really big, wide open sleeve that's gathered, that's tied together down the back of the arm. This is more so here, but again, you've got those chemise puffs coming out. This one has sort of taken it to the next level, but with the slits on the slide. So you're seeing the sort of slashing of the sleeves here, where the, the chemise sort of, pokes out. Very cute. What I love about this from a costuming point of view is you actually get to see the back of dresses, which is so difficult to see normally. And what you've got here is actually quite a smooth back. There's no indication of lacing at all, which kind of makes me wonder because you don't get the front lacing. Was it not shown? Were they front lacing? 
we just don't know, which is somewhat tragic. But um, what I'm actually wearing today, stick it up a wee bit, is um, my Portuguese sort of day dress slash underground, and I chose to make that front lacing partly so I could get in and out of it, my in and out of it myself, but also. Um, because we do see these, you get the sense that possibly some of them were front lacing. We'll talk more about, about those later. Um, love the sleeves down here. They're a bit more fitted, but certainly you still get those giant puffs of chemise coming out. And I would imagine that the chemises of this period are quite heavy in terms of material. So you have quite a lot of fabric in here to allow for those puffs. Very cute. I don't know quite what the black thing is under there, whether that's like a... Um, neck gorgier or partlet type thing or quite what's going on again it's into the unknown territory is it the back of the chemise there some really cute with costume details here ignore the gore the hat now here we're seeing these hats coming in and we'll see these a lot in this particular cycle um and they're kind of like a flat cap um but they sort of have this almost like duck bill back to them with this veil hanging off down the down the back here, and you see this time and time again. And underneath here are these little aglets. Now, whether they're just decorative features or tied in some way, don't know, but they're really interesting. We'll see quite a lot of this sort of hat. These ones are in that museum in, in Lisbon, so you can go and visit them there. They're by Portuguese artists. They're very Portuguese. So I think if you're looking for a something which is definitively Portuguese. These are some really good images to look at. And it goes on and there are different panels in the cycle here. We've got this beautiful dress here, which has got the puffs, but again, even more so here. And it opens open back. Um, it's a bit harder to tell what she's wearing um, because she is dressed in this sort of queenly fashion. But you can see the hat again. And often they'll have a jewel sort of attached to the side of their head, just sort of just above the ear there, which seems to be very common. And then hair, the hair goes over the years. Very pretty. Very um, beautiful fabrics as well. Question? The, Dutch Wa Duchess uh, Wana from the West said it was maybe possibly tied to the crown. Yeah, that's actually a very good thought, actually. If anyone has any more insights, then please let me just add them to the chat. I'd really like to hear what you've got to say as well. Um, I feel like this is going to be a very sort of this is going to be a, a lengthy research project for me, and I feel like I'm almost at the start of it. So I really appreciate hearing what other people have to say too. And here we've got the arrival of the relics again, Santayota again. But interestingly, you've got the wee gap here, and I wonder this is, if this is like a front. This does up at the front. We've got the wee hat again. Interesting belt here. It's got. Um, it reminds me of some of those 15th century ones with the metal sort of fittings at the front and then the chain down there. What I love about these is you do see some of the, these paintings particularly, is you see some of those buildings that would have been in Portugal in the 16th century, which of course all disappeared in the earthquake and the tsunami. So you get a sense of what Renaissance Lisbon would have looked like. Um, there's something that is really good in that Global City book as they talk a wee bit about that. And here we've got the departure. Love the sleeves on this. Again, the same sort of thing that tie, the ties down the back of the arm, the big puffs, which creates more volume. Yep. Okay. Uh, any idea if the shoulder puffs, um, not the back of the arms ones, are sewn in? I think that, it's... That's an awful lot of puffs to fuss with yep. if they aren't sewn it in. It is. They may, uh, the way that most of these sleeves look to be tied in, and I'd imagine that in terms of utility, it'd be much easier to have the tied in sleeves. So I think it's it probably is. And if you look at my chemise here, you can pull it up or your chemise up a good bit if you've got a good bit of bulk in it to actually create those puffs. And the other thing to remember is in paintings, everyone's beautifully standing still, and it doesn't account for human movement in this sort of thing. Where I think you would get chemises. It would sort of slip away a wee bit, but certainly I think with a bit of pressure there between your ties, you can get that effect. And if you choose the right sort of weight of linen, as they would have done it in the period, um, 
a lot of mine are made out of cotton. I find in New Zealand it's very hard to get linen that's a proper kind of weight here. A lot of what we get here is great for Viking under tunics, but not so great for actually making chemises out of, because it doesn't have the sort of fine weave that they would have had in period. But certainly I don't think it's difficult to get that puff. Okay, uh, second question from, uh, I think it's Michaela. Um, could the lacing of the dress be hidden under the front of the panel and then pinned in place similar to the English? And could the black showing under that dress be lighter than the uh, the undercurrent, like a under kirtle, kirtle. Like a day day dress? Very likely, to be honest. Um, until we actually get we we find any written records which talk about what the different layers are, it's all speculation. Um, I found in terms of wearing it, I like having the, a supportive undergown because I've got a lot of my the strain is taken in my layer of linen here, my cheaper fabric, which means that my over gown my, in my silk doesn't have to take that much weight to it. So, and it is very likely looking at the context of 16th century clothing that they would have had some sort of underlayer with an overlayer over the top. And whether it is peaking at the back like that is very likely. Okay. Um, as to the panels, again, possibly. Uh, um, I found with mine, with the front lacing here, that the lacing actually shows through when you put the overdress over the top. So I've actually got a wee panel that I pin to my underdress so, so it hides the lacing. Okay, I got three or four more. Um, yep. Catherine says uh, those chemises are absolutely huge. That was just more of a yes. comment. And then uh, Alaria, and I apologize for names. Um, is there a reason that the hair covers the ears? I remember in Virtue and Beauty, a discussion of late 15th century Italian veils mentioned a, brief, a belief that the Virgin Mary conceived through the ear. Could that be a similar thing in Portugal? I think it's very likely. It's a very Catholic country. I think it's probably got to do with female modesty and wanting to show your, show not show off. I remember, I don't know if anyone's read Little House on the Prairie, um, how big Ma was about not showing you her ears off and her, because it was sort of seen as a sign of modesty in the 19th century and how much that is sort of part of it as well. And I mean, a lot of the figures we're looking at are looking, we're looking at saints and how they're depicted as wanting to show them as virtuous individuals. So I think the hair, the ear covering is probably part of that as well. Okay, and then uh, Antonia? says, it, I see the front part of the dress and it looks like it's wrapped. Is that what you see? What am I wrapped? I'm not quite sure what wrapped. Probably as in it's a piece of fabric covering back across. The could be, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely not there. This one potentially could be, although it looks like, I think that V there is possibly like the one here, the same sort of dress. There's certainly a big sort of over, this, this one here, she's got that sort of um, wrap over her, which I think sort of obscures the bodice a wee bit because it looks for quite a similar fabric. Yeah, that's... So... Okay, and then the last question that we have right now. Tied to History has some beautifully lightweight linen. Uh, Burnley uh, and Towbridge does yes. too. Neither of those are cheap, and that's from Juana. Yeah. Yeah, then you can get the really light, beautiful lightweight linen, but getting enough to make a giant voluminous chemise, it's sort of something that you'll do one off. And I like to have my chemises so that I can wash them fairly frequently and um, they're not too expensive and I can replace them as needs be because yeah, they do, do get a lot of use. I also spend a lot of time in the kitchen and I find that um, I don't want to subject $200 worth of chemise to a kitchen. So it's really up to you and what works for you. Okay, I think we're good. Cool. So yeah, we've got this lovely beret start. There's a, uh, a much better close up of these hats here and you can kind of see the bit at the back that it goes down like that and the ties. Very cute. And here we've got St. Catherine. So this is a different cycle of painting, same artist. And you can see again the hat there, but this, the brim here is um, quite segmented. There's another one a bit later on that looks like it's got that sort of the cuts, the slashes to the brim. Again, looking at our sleeves here, this one goes out even more intense because it's got the, the um, slashing here with the chemise coming out of it. 
this is my favorite this is the one that i made i'll show you my version of it a bit later with um the pink dress here and you can see once again the, sh the chemise puffs the ties um this has the hat now again visitation gregorio lopez again when i first made this hat i made it quite square and like a pillbox hat and it wasn't until i took got my camera out and got my my gregorio lopez book and took a close-up photo of it that i could actually see the detailing of it and as you can see it is very similar to those other ones that we saw it is actually quite soft and it's got this sort of slit brim all the way around and then this one is very well blinged up if you can look at the side there whether that's similar to those aglets that you see on the other dress but she's got this giant medallion on there as well which is very cool um neckline of the chemise here this one's slightly different and that the chemise sort of comes up just around the collarbone rather than being high neck so i think you get a variety of styles in portugal at this point in time in terms of chemise heights that is such a pretty dress this one this is an oddity I've put this in a wee bit as an oddity, but also because it is quite interesting. Um, some of you will have heard of Isabella of Portugal. That's the great Titian image um, of her in that sort of um, orangey coloured dress. Um, it's very, you know, very beautiful. Um, but this is a very early one of her. It's dating from 1526. And if the attribution of this is correct and it's um, in an Italian gallery and it is painted by the same person that painted all those Santa Aota pictures and it is 1526. It would have been painted just before she went to, to Spain to marry Charles. So it is likely to be a Portuguese image. It is quite different from the Santa Aota ones. Um, to start off with the chemise there, if you, or the, the sleeves there, you can get it tied in. But the chemise doesn't the sleeves don't seem to open down the back it's just a sort of giant sort of massive puffs and then the neckline is quite sort of square and i don't know quite what's going on with her hair so they sort of tried to put it up like that and then it kind of fell over a wee bit um it is not a well painted portrait but it is quite interesting in terms of the context of of her at this point in time being in portugal rather than later on when we see her where she's very much in a spanish style of dress this one here this is um looking at portuguese royalty again is queen catherine of austria now queen catherine was the wife of king jowl the third and he was the king after Manuel, so he was Manuel's son. Catherine comes to Portugal in around about 1525, and we've got later portraits of her by Moore, which we'll talk, of, talk about later, but this particular one is her as a young woman, and um, again, it's quite different to the Sintayota ones. Again, here's over the ears, though, with this beautiful chemise with this sort of gold detailing on it, like a sunburst, and then this dress here which has got this, the embroidery around the neckline which is just lovely and then you get these panelled sleeves that again you've got the puffs through got the tied in very part of that sort of package bodice height doesn't look too dissimilar from the outer as well same sort of length of bodice question uh, two comments one from beatrice that they get um three ounce linen from fabricstores.com and then Isabella Maria says shipping to New Zealand almost doubles the cost. Mm -hmm. And then Juana, I it goes back to the Isabella picture. Is Isabella's chemise neck low because um, at that stage she was still a maiden um, rather than a married queen? Quite possible. I mean, this is where we unfortunately enter the we into the temp territory of surmise here that without the written records about clothing cost, um, customs it's hard to kind of piece it together and we've got to kind of go with what we can see in the portraits and it is likely that her as someone who was a, as a potential marriage prospect they wanted to show off her beautiful skin on her neck and her sort of decolletage to you know, show that she is a lovely maiden maybe that is part of it as opposed to the more religious images where they want them to be a bit more covered up because they those virtues of modesty and chastity are very much part of being a, a catholic saint particularly if you're a woman okay and then uh michaela just posted on catherine 
Could the black applique lace be on the neckline? Around here? Yeah. I think it's on the it's certainly on the neckline of the dress. Because you can see the, the that sort of buttery yellow sort of pops up between the different the little bits of the um applique or embroidery. It's very cute and very different to some of the other things you see as well here. And again, I think this is part of in the 1520s, Portugal's still quite keen to show off, though their, their influence is waning to an extent. I don't think they'd quite realised it yet, and they were still keen to show off themselves as being a powerhouse. So I do think this image of Catherine as Saint Catherine is part of that. Again, it's sort of connecting their, 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 their um, image as royalty to um, the religious imagery of the time as well, and sort of saying that Catherine is this very virtuous figure. So you sort of get that coming into it as well. I do love the cloth of gold on her sleeves and the segmented sleeves. They're very cool. This one is definitely an oddity. Um, I have, I've struggled to find much in terms of the attributions of who painted this, when it was painted. Is it actually of Catherine of Austria? It is one of those ones that I sort of put in because we just, there's not enough evidence for me to be fairly convinced that this is actually a Portuguese painting. As opposed to this one, which is in the Prado and has a really good sort of text in, in, in its Prado um, online database about it as a painting of Catherine of, of Austria. This one doesn't have any of that. And it's certainly got oddities for the time. Like if you look around her neck at the um, ruff, you don't really see ruffs until much later. She's also got one around her hands as well. Plus, you've got this, the funny sort of metal bits on the chemise as well. At the point, I was talking to Isabel Maria the other day about this, and she sort of said, it's not painted by anyone who's actually worn a chemise. It doesn't sit in the, in the right way for a chemise. And why would you put metal on a chemise that's often washed? It just doesn't seem quite right. I wonder if it was overpainted a bit later, whether it's actually a Victorian image, but it's thinking about that, being cautious about your artwork. Um, one thing that's interesting is you first, this is the first sign you see of earrings at this point in time. And again, that makes me wonder if bits of this are a lot later. The hair is very much like the Titian Isabella Portugal image with the plait and the puff out to the side too. So whether that was copied from there, it just doesn't quite work. Which is a shame because it's a beautiful dress. If you look at that pearl work on there, it's just stunning. Yeah. This is some of the problems you get as you go through. You get things which are purported to be Portuguese that aren't. Um, we've got trapped in bush. Um, when Christoph Wiedetz did all this painting of, or the, this creation of the trapped in bush of, of book of um, 1529, he was in Spain and he was in Portugal, so he was painting things that he was seeing. And it is interesting because you've got the hat again, which, how much is this, is this a Portuguese thing? We don't know, but it's interesting. Um, question? Yeah, Stasi says, um, is it also, it also could be smocking, embroidery in the smocking um, on the yeah. chemise? Could well be. Yeah, that 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 could that could be that. But um, I find the sleeves interesting here. It's a similar idea. You get the chemise coming out of it. Um, that it's quite looks like some of the German ones. I'm not quite sure how they'd work in theory in real reality those chemises, but they're just interesting. You got the partlet around the neckline. Um, probably front opening there. If you look at that, it's got a line down there. Not lacing necessarily, but hook and eye potentially. Very interesting dress. And I think if we're looking at Portuguese, something which is definitively Portuguese, that's quite a good one to look at there. Moving into the 1530s and we start to see a wee bit of a change in Portuguese dress. You're not seeing quite so much of the chemise any longer. Um, if you look here at this lovely teal coloured one that you've got, it's quite similar to that traction book um, sleeve with the puffs and but this is all made out of the dress fabric. High neck chemises again. Um, I wonder how much those hats are realistic and how much of that are uh, that showing off them as martyrs. 
Um, I love this black um, kind of coat thing that she's got over the top. That if you, if you imagine it on a cold day, having that over your neckline would just be lovely with the fur lining. Um, and it looks like it's got tied in sleeves again. It does indicate to me that's very much a convention of Portuguese dress, those tied in sleeves. But very, very cute. Again, these paintings are really interesting, this particular cycle, because they show off 16th century Lisbon in the background. And you can see that's the India house where all the um, merchant ships came to and traded from. And you can sort of see the centre of Portugal there. It's just lovely, They're just for, in it for that reason. If you look at men's clothing, there's some really cool men's stuff there too. I'm not going to touch on that because I figure I'm probably already going over time. But yeah, beautiful. Interestingly, you've got puffy tops and the tighter undersleeves here. So you're certainly seeing a sort of shift in style of this period. Um, this image I borrowed off um, Duchess Constanzia. She took it when during one of her trips to Portugal. And it is quite cool because you can see the high neck chemise here. And the three dresses that we look at here are quite subdued in a way, and they're all of attendance. So if you're looking for something which is less high status, more of a um, everyday kind of dress, these are quite good images for that. But again, back opening um, sleeve there with the tie. And this one I just love, is just beautiful, the, this velvet dress here. And you can see Again, the tied backs. Um, she's got a lovely wee coif on, I think. And the the part little chemise around the neckline. You could have a look at those ones as well. I haven't. I've chosen not to touch on those. This is sort of looking at the sort of idea of this sort of upper upper class um, Portuguese dress that I'm looking at. How much of these are realistic? How much of these are um, based on the size of religious painting, I don't know. But that one to me, that, that dress there looks looks realistic. I can I can see what that one would look like in reality. Same sort of, yeah, see the, the um, part little chemise coming down there. I put this section in because when we talk about Portuguese dress, often you see people who are of Portugal. Now, how does this influence their style of dress? And how much of the paintings of them are actually Portuguese dress? And how much of them are more like the um, wherever they've moved to, like Beatrice here moves to Savoy in France and um, is very active in the north of Italy as well. She becomes Countess of Asti in the north of Italy in her own right. But how does this influence her dress? And how much of her dress has become more like where she, where she moves to? Um, if you've got that, um, the court, those those two volumes, um, Court of the Spanish Cl of uh, Clothing of the Spanish Court books, they have a couple of really good articles on women who move to parts of the world and either take or lose their Spanish style of dress with them. And I think you can apply some of what they talk about there to these women here. Um, Catherine of Aragon, they talk about how she starts off in England looking quite. Spanish, but as, as time goes on, she her address anglicizes more and more. Um, yep. Okay, I think this is from the previous question. Yep. Interesting way the attendance sleeves tie from behind. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, that's from Lenore, I think. Uh, Michaela, also, uh, they also have V's um, at the top of their bodice. Could be an indication mm. of a front opening. Yeah. And Juana, um, Spanish fashion at the courts of early modern Europe. Yeah, thank you. And we're up to about 10 minutes left. Oh, geez. <laughs> All right. So, and I put Isabella of Portugal in because she is often seen as the definitive Portuguese dress, and I don't feel she is. Um, she goes to Spain, she becomes Queen of Spain at a time when Spain is becoming more and more a world powerhouse. And therefore, I think depictions of her are wanting to show her possibly as more Spanish than Portuguese. Um, although you see this, the Portuguese sort of influence here in those big hanging sleeves and the openness of them as well. Um, this portrait is problematic if you're looking at it from a costuming point of view because it is painted nearly a decade after she dies. And I think the way that it's painted is more in line with the fashions of the 1540s and the 1530s because of that stiffened bodice. Um, so it is an interesting one. 
aspects of Portuguese, but also aspects of not. And it's Scots there as well. And then we've got all these ones which are marked as Sibylla Portugal. And how, how do we know that they are? Really interesting in terms of attribution. I want to talk here about Salome a bit, particularly the red dress. What we see here is a sort of late 1530s style of fashion. Again, we've got this slashing in the sleeves, but you've also got these big hanging over sleeves that you see. And we'll see them a bit later as well. Possibly front opening bodice. Possibly that's part of the decoration. I haven't really managed to get a close-up of this one, which is kind of annoying. Is that it? Are they transatas? Are they not? I'm just not sure. This codice is one of my favourite finds. This is paint um, portraits of Portuguese people in India and in the Middle East during this time of colonial expansion. And so you're seeing these Portuguese women dressed in a very anglicised way. It must have been very hot. So the high neck, high neck chemises here. But again, the black thing over the top. And they've got these hair nets in, which is really cool. This is probably my favourite one of this. Um, this is Portuguese ladies dining at, at Hormuz, which is in um, the Middle East. And um, if you can see, they're actually sitting in a puddle of water. And the idea was it was so hot that to cool themselves down, they sat in this sort of puddle and ate their dinner. And the... Um, style of these two dresses is quite similar to that Salome dress in that you've got what looks to be a front opening bodice, the high neck chemises, um, the slashed under sleeve. This one's got a wee cap to it, I think, the overdress. Well this one here you've got that, like those uh, martyr dresses, you've got the puffy overtop and then the tight under sleeve. She's got the net, she's got some sort of weird wrapped donut on her head. They're really interesting paintings these ones of, again, not necessarily very high status women, but women who are at a, you know, wealthy woman, how they dress at this point in time. And then we, yep, question? Yep, so that's what shallow ponds are for. That's from why. Apparently so, yes. Yeah. Well, I think Christine. we could use it too sometimes. Oh yeah, oh uh, yeah, definitely. Hot day at um, our, our big event in February it would be lovely to have a big pond of water to sit in. Um, 1540s, again, it changes. What you see here is what the sort of great flattening of the bodice area, that you, lo you lose that lovely curve that you see in these earlier images. So you can see the underline of her bust is there, and it gets far more structured. The other thing you see is this is the first time you see farthingales really popping into Portuguese fashion at this point in time. From the 1530s, you've still got those big hanging over sleeves, although these ones are closed up, but they're still slashed and that undersleeve as well. This painting is interesting because in 1542, this French artist Trouvel goes to Lisbon to paint the court and he paints Maria Manuela before she goes to Spain to marry, or to Spain to marry Charles. And so this is possibly a sort of betrothal portrait of her before she goes off. And he, yep, question? Five minutes? All right, I'll really quickly run through these last ones. Um, and we've got her again in miniature here. And you can see the hairs change to being this, the puff over the ear being these real sort of frizzy almost rolls here. Um, again, the jewel stays, but you're seeing, you're seeing earrings again. So 1540s, just definitely getting the earrings coming in. And you'll see that Maria Manuela, she's got these beautiful pearls hanging here too. This is Princess Maria of Portugal. I really wanted to talk about her because she is my favorite person. I, this is a person I would like to be if I lived in Portugal. Maria was the daughter of King Manuel and his last wife, Eleanor of Austria. And when King Emmanuel died, um, Eleanor went to France and married the King of France. Maria, however, stays in Portugal. And she's brought up in the Portuguese court with um, Queen Catherine, who we saw earlier, as being basically like a surrogate mother to her. Eventually, after um, Eleanor's husband dies, she comes back to Spain and she says to Maria, my daughter, come and live with me. Maria goes to live with mum, spends three weeks with her and then nopes out and goes back to Portugal. I think she realises that mum is not quite what she thought she was, but she lives, she never marries, and she lives as this wealthy woman who is the Duchess of Vizier in her own right. Um, she's a patroness of monasteries and the arts and culture in Portugal in the 1540s and 1550s. I love her, I just think she's just awesome. Beautiful hairnet she's got here, in the big puff over the ears, Lovely embroidery you start to see. You see this with Maria Manuel as well. 
that you get the embroidered sort of trim coming in on the bodices and she's got this black sort of coat over it as well that's slashed in the sleeves high neck chemise still beautiful picture this one and this is Truvail again in those 1542 series of paintings that he did possibly a sketch for a painting he did got Maria again rough finally makes me very suspicious of that 1530 painting of Catherine again high neck a very high neck dress here but the hair sort of moved off the ears, which you see in the 1550s. I'm a little suspicious of this one. It doesn't quite ring true for the 1540s. It may be a bit later. And we've got, this is one which is often identified as Portuguese, but probably more of a Spanish dress in a Portuguese style. Um, the Prado, that's in the Prado, that one. I'll come back to that one. I just wanted to talk about these last two images. This is in the 1550s, you see, these paintings that are done by Moore of Catherine of Austria and Maria. And the style is incredibly different. And it's very similar. It reminds me quite a bit of, um, I put in my notes there, of um, that kirtle and um, loose gown that you see in um, patterns of fashion. It looks very similar to that sort of style of dress. And I think probably for Catherine, when this is painted, she's an older woman. And she's had a lot of children, and probably this is a style that she finds flattering and comfortable. And Maria, as a surrogate daughter, probably is looking to emulate or kind of support her adopted mother in her style of dress here. And this cycle of paintings was done by Moore going to the, the Portuguese court in the 1550s. And again, it's showing them off as being very Portuguese at this point in time as well, I think is the, sort of one of the, the aims of this portrait in terms of the fabric and the way that it looks. And again, the puffs over the years, but again, even more stylized with um, sort of the netting over them. How much time have I got left? Three minutes. Just wanted to go back to this one. This one pops up quite a bit. Um, as being a Portuguese dress, and I am very suspicious of it. Um, it is apparently of some of Beatrice of Lancaster, the Jes Duchess of Gonzaga. And as you excuse my Portuguese pronunciation, it's not good. But and it's connected to her page on Wikipedia. But this is one of those being careful about what you see online, and particularly on sources like Wikipedia, because that does not look Portuguese to me. It looks very much like the Tom Ring circle of, of um, German paintings. The face looks Portuguese, but the dress does not. Now, then you have to wonder, is this a later painting? Is it something odd that's sort of crept into Portuguese, uh, that's been attributed as Portuguese and is not? Very interesting. When I went back and went backwards from the Wikipedia page about the um, attributions of this, all it came up with was this sort of weird chat page that didn't, to me, didn't ring true as a good source of, of um, Portuguese-ness for this particular painting. So as one of those oddities, again, there may be something will pop up in a few years' time that will show that this is definitive, definitively Portuguese, but that is definitively Portuguese. It is painted of a Portuguese queen to show off Portuguese power by a Spanish artist who was brought in for that purpose. This, I don't know. Uh, right, Michaela, questions. Michaela says it looks Austrian. Mm -hmm. And then um, Terrell um, reminds yes. me of Anne of Cleves' dress. Yeah, it's very similar to that sort of region, isn't it? It just mm, doesn't say Portuguese to me at all. And it's so different from what you get later in the Portuguese world as well, which is very much more that sort of Spanish style. That it, I don't think the, the fashion would have evolved in that direction. It just doesn't seem right. Okay. Um, is there any more questions? We have about one minute left. <laughs> I'm not seeing any more questions. Yep. And there's your outfits. Those are, um, those are what I meant. Very nice. Um, um, go ahead. The hat. The hat there is not quite right. It's what I made um, based on what I originally saw, but I think I'd make it, I'm going to make a different version of that later on. Okay. Well, I would like to thank you, um, uh, Joanna, and all the participants um, that have come to this class. It was a very wonderful class. And on the chat, there's everybody saying thank you. And it was wonderful. 
Um, oh, and no, I thank you all for coming and letting me talk about it. I really enjoyed that. And if you if you do have any more thoughts or more questions, please don't hesitate to, to drop me a line on Facebook or um, I've got my blog up there as well. And I love to talk talk about this with people who are have maybe more knowledge or would like to know more as well. It'd be great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm stopping thank you. The, I'm stopping the recording. And <laughs> you can either stay around for belt hacks um, or... <laughs>